Good morning and welcome to Church at Home. You're all so welcome as we join together to worship. And this morning is a really exciting time for us. First of all, it's exciting because this is the last in our series of Church at Home, uh, because we're going to be meeting here together in the building next weekend. And I'll say more about that later. But it's also exciting because it's Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of the time of year when we turn our attention, especially to the climax of Jesus' earthly ministry in his death and resurrection. Psalm 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. And Jesus showed us the depths of that love by his death on the cross. And as he entered Jerusalem where he would do that, the crowds praised him. And so we join with them this morning to praise Jesus. So let's join in praise and worship of Jesus as we sing together, Hosanna. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you.
Let's continue to worship as we pray. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Our Father, we do indeed come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we do that, our time of worship together this morning would be a time when we know his presence with us and that he would have his way in us as we worship, as we pray, as we read your word and hear it preached, and as we sing. May he speak to us and teach us, and may his will be done in us through the Holy Spirit whom he so freely gives. And so we shout with those crowds so long ago, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we know that that's a cry that praises you because you can save us. And we rejoice that you are the God who saves us. And Lord, we acknowledge before you today that we are people in need of saving, people who so often go our own way and do our own thing rather than following you. Lord, in this last week, we confess that we have not always obeyed your commands, that our words and our thoughts have not always honoured you, and we have not spoken and acted in the ways you call us to. And so we ask that you would forgive us these sins as we confess them, and may we know freedom from the guilt and shame that were rightly ours, but which Jesus took from us on the cross. Thank you for that death for us, so that we could be free from sin and know you both now and forever. And as we look to the cross and the empty grave that we celebrate at Easter, we praise you that we are going to be able to meet together in person to worship you and to proclaim and celebrate what you have done for us. Thank you for the effectiveness of the vaccine rollout so far. Thank you for falling case numbers and hospitalizations and even deaths. Lord, we do lift before you this morning those whose lives are affected so negatively by this pandemic, in their work, in their family, in their health, both mental and physical. But we thank you that things seem to be going in the right direction, and we pray that this would continue to be the case. Thank you that we will meet together soon. But in the meantime, we ask as we come to this familiar story of that Palm Sunday, that you would speak to us powerfully, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Easter doesn't begin with a cross and a crown of thorns. It begins with the triumphal entry and the waving of palm branches. In fact, hundreds of years before this ultimate sacrifice, God spoke through prophets like Zechariah and laid out the exact events that would take place. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And Jesus did exactly that. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, Jesus sent two of them ahead with these instructions. Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. The gathering crowds knew this man was so important, they spread their own garments on the old, dirty road for him, and shouted with joy, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And when this great man of God finally entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered their own question. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. And we're going to be thinking about the significance of those events in a few moments. But before we do that, let's join together again in praising him as we sing, Fairest Lord Jesus.
Palm Sunday is one of those events that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And this morning we're going to read the account that we find in the Gospel of John. It's found in John chapter 12 and beginning at verse 1. This is God's Word. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we give you thanks for your word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, handed down through generation after generation to us, Lord, so that you may speak to us. So Lord, we pray that you would help each of us to focus our hearts on you. And Lord, may you do what I can't do and what no one else here on this earth can do. Lord, would you speak to us from your word? For Jesus' sake. Amen. I wonder, have you ever been involved in a reenactment of some kind? Do you know the sort of thing that I mean, where people dress up and they act out some historical event, usually some kind of battle? A few years ago, I had a few friends over from Hungary and they were visiting and one day the weather was really nice, so we went up to the north coast. And when we got to Ballantoy Harbour, there was a group there doing a tour, but not just any tour, it was a Game of Thrones tour. And they were all dressed up and they were acting out some battle scene on the beach where it had actually been recorded in the programme. And you know, they were really getting into it. You could hear their battle cries and their shouts and they were acting out this great battle. Now, I've never read a word of Game of Thrones and I've never watched any episode of it. And based on what I saw, I probably never will, but they seem to be enjoying themselves. But I can remember, and this is maybe a little bit more tame, but when I was at primary school, we had the opportunity to visit the Causeway School up beside the Giants Causeway. And we did a 1930s school day. So we all dressed up. I had the short trousers and all on, I remember it well, and we had to bring a packed lunch. I remember the salt and shake crisps, and we had lessons in the old school room. I remember that the teacher had a cane and she pulled some of the class up to the front at various times and pretended to give them a good rattle with it. Now, there were some people in my class who probably could have done with a good whack, but that's another story. The whole thing was really fun. It was really enjoyable. 
But the thing that strikes me most about it as I look back, the thing I suppose that was most memorable from that experience is that we didn't just learn about school in the 1930s. We did do that, but we also got to see things through the eyes of 1930s children, just as they would have seen it. It wasn't just information to learn, but we experienced it. About a week before we went to take part in that day, we each got a book, and that book described our character. We were each given a name. They were the real names of children from that school in the 1930s. I was James McFall, and we were all told about our family backgrounds, where we lived, and what we were like at school, the things we enjoyed doing and the things we didn't like so much. Now, this was really fascinating. And then, of course, on the day we had to act this all out. It wasn't just history. We actually got into the mindset of real children from the time. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I wonder, do you ever do this with passages of Scripture? Maybe you've been involved in or you've watched some kind of dramatic group acting out a story from the Bible. And it really does give a different perspective on each of the characters, doesn't it? Especially if you're given a character and you have to think about how they might act. Otherwise, sometimes when we look at a passage of Scripture, we just read through it and we get the overview but we don't see things from the ground level. So rather than just thinking about the story from John 12 this morning, which I think is probably very familiar to lots of us, I'd like us to briefly consider each of the characters and what each one brings to the scenarios we read about, and maybe think about how we face similar issues in our own walk with Jesus. And the story is familiar to lots of us. Um, a few weeks ago, we saw that Jesus was on his journey up to the Passover feast, he passed through a town called Jericho, met a man called Zacchaeus, and then after that, he headed to Bethany. And in John chapter 11, we read all about that. It's probably one of the most significant of Jesus' miracles when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And so there is a dinner being given in honor of Jesus. The passage tells us that they were reclining at the table, which would actually suggest that it was more of a feast than a dinner. It was a big event. And during this feast, Mary breaks out extremely expensive perfume and anoints Jesus with it. She rubs his feet with her hair. Other gospel writers say she poured the perfume on his head, while John records it as being poured out on the feet of Jesus. And it's very likely that both are completely true. Jesus said that his body is being prepared for burial, so that it's likely that more than one part of his body is anointed, but each gospel writer focuses on one for their own reasons. The aroma of the perfume, we're told, it fills the whole house. Judas objects to this. He says the perfume could have been sold and all the money given to the poor, but John reveals to us that his motives were selfish. He liked to dip his hands into the group funds. Meanwhile, the crowd who saw the raising of Lazarus, they arrive, and then a second crowd who are heading for the Passover feast, they see Jesus heading for Jerusalem, and they run out to join him, praising him and calling him the King of Israel, shouting, Hosanna! And then the first crowd go from there, and they continue to spread the good news about Jesus and what he did for Lazarus. So it seems like there are two crowds, although there's a bit of debate about that in the commentaries, whether it's one crowd that kind of gets split up or whether it's two separate crowds. But for the purposes of today, I'm just going to talk generally about the crowd as one, because we're more interested in what they did rather than who they are. So we'll consider them as one and the same today. Meanwhile, in the background of all this, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they are grumbling and bitter. And they're not only plotting to kill Jesus, but also Lazarus, because of how the crowds are following Jesus after raising Lazarus from the dead. So what about those religious leaders then? We'll start with them. These men simply refuse to believe, despite very striking evidence. It's likely that as religious leaders, they saw the body of Lazarus after he died and that they visited the sisters. At the very least, they would have known people coming to the temple to cleanse themselves because that's what the Old Testament law said you had to do if you'd been in contact with a dead body. And now clearly they could see that Lazarus was alive. He was standing in front of them. And yet, put simply, they refuse to believe. They grumble. 
the very last verse. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, there are certainly plenty of people in the world around us who have this kind of view of Jesus, aren't there? They don't believe that he is who he claimed to be. But maybe there are even some watching this morning who are a little bit like those religious leaders, maybe more than it might appear at first. Maybe you believe that Jesus existed and did good things, but you're not a follower of his. You've got the evidence in front of you. You've seen what the Bible has to say about him. You're interested, but you're not committed. Maybe you don't come to church. Maybe you do. But I think this morning that this passage is quite a stark warning for you, if that is you. And the warning is this. One sin leads to another. We see it with those Pharisees. They're already plotting to kill Jesus. And now because his fame is growing after raising Lazarus, it seems to them like the whole world's going after Jesus. Well, now they're plotting to kill Lazarus as well. Now you might say to me, come on, John, it's not like that. I might not be a follower of Jesus, but I'm not like that. I'm not going to kill anybody. And that's probably true. I certainly hope it is. But the fact remains that if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, then your sins aren't dealt with, and so they remain with you. And if that's the case, the Bible tells us that the reward for our sins is death. But the good news is that if you're willing to put Jesus first, and we'll see this in a moment as others did, then the reward is eternal life with Jesus. The religious leaders did not put Jesus first, and so their sin only led to more sin. And that is a serious warning for us this morning. If our sins are not dealt with, then we remain in sin and separated from God and destined only for death. What about Judas then? Well, it's difficult for us to think about Judas, isn't it? Because we know that he's going to go on and betray Jesus. But in this passage, actually at first he doesn't seem so bad. What he says would have sounded very sensible to everybody around him. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He suggests that the perfume should have been sold, not used and the money given to help the poor. That sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, Mary didn't have to use the perfume in that way. From the passage, it seems that her actions came completely out of the blue. So maybe Judas is right. But we soon learn that his motives are false. John tells us that he was more interested in the money for himself. Verse 6, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You see, he says the right thing, and he wants to be seen to be saying the right thing. He wants to be heard saying the right thing in front of other people, but his motives are not right. He's in it for himself, and he's not putting Jesus first. He does not recognize Jesus as king. As Jesus points out, helping the poor is good, but serving him is more important. And for us in church, this is also quite a serious warning. Now, I'm not saying that any of us are going to walk away or turn our backs on Jesus, and we're grateful that our finances as a church, they're laid open for everyone to see, they're audited, the accounts come out every year. It's all above board. So I don't mean that. But what I am saying is that it's often easy to be heard saying the right things, isn't it? Even when there's an underlying problem, in our heart. Maybe for some people, it's that they're in church and they say the right things and do lots of the right things, but they've never given their lives to Christ. If that's you this morning, please know that you're in as much danger as those Pharisees and as Judas. Someone once said that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. We can be seen to be doing the right things What is Jesus number one in our lives? The crowd then, will they go even a step further than Judas? Not only do they say and shout the right things, they even do some of the right things. They came to the dinner to see Jesus and Lazarus, and the crowd praised Jesus as he entered Jerusalem, 
And then they went on and they continued to spread the word about Jesus after he had entered Jerusalem. That's what we read in verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Now, I don't want to paint the crowd in an absolutely terrible light here. It's possible that some of them did not desert Jesus and were part of the group of believers that saw him after the resurrection. But many, many of the crowd did not have that devotion. They shouted Jesus' praise and did the right thing when it suited them. But when times got tough, they proved themselves to be shallow in their love of Jesus. The same crowd that shouted Hosanna later shouted crucify him when the religious leaders pressured them to do so. And again, this is a danger for us as followers of Jesus. It's quite possible to say and even to do the right things, but if Jesus doesn't take first place, then we might just be wasting our time. And this can happen very easily in church because so often people just kind of get on with getting on in church. They keep things ticking over. They keep things running. Maybe it's an organization. Maybe it's something else. Many of those things are really, really important. They volunteer to help with things. They come along to events, but it's not for the right reasons. Maybe it's because there's a crowd of people doing it or our friends are doing it. We like that group and we kind of follow blindly. We go along for the company or the social interaction or the crack. Maybe they serve in some way and they've always done that job. And at first they did it for Jesus, but now they just kind of do it out of habit. Or maybe they never wanted the job in the first place, but they're stuck with it now and kind of just get on with it. Now, if that is you today, I am not saying that you should stop serving or stop coming along or anything like that. It might be true for some people, but it's probably not. The point is that we need to get the right perspective. If we're not serving Jesus, then we need to ask ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. If it's for ourselves, like Judas, because we enjoy it or we get something out of it, or whether we follow the crowd, or whether we're not even sure how we ended up where we are, but we're here and Jesus isn't number one, then we need to put that right. And maybe as we start to meet together as a church again, and hopefully in the months ahead, we get to do more than just meeting on a Sunday, then maybe each one of us needs to think about that. What am I involved in? Why am I involved in it? Is Jesus first in it? And if not, what do I need to do about that? For many in the crowd, Jesus wasn't first, and the consequences for them were disastrous. Finally, and you'll notice that we're not looking at absolutely every character in this passage, but what about Mary? We can see that her sister Martha is busy in the kitchen. Mary has chosen instead to be with Jesus. It's very similar to the account in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus visits the sisters. We looked at that with Marty back in January. And again, here it seems that Mary has chosen what is best. She takes out some pure nard, a very expensive perfume. She pours it on Jesus and wipes his feet with her hair. And this is noticed by everybody. They couldn't not notice it as the smell fills the entire house. Now, Mary clearly did an extremely kind act, giving something very expensive and precious for Jesus. But even so, you might be tempted to ask, isn't that just like what Judas did? If we're saying that he was showing off and wanting others to think more highly of him, was Mary doing the same thing? Well, you might think that, but I don't think so. And here's why. First of all, Mary had understood what was more important. Yes, work for the poor was and is important, but as Jesus pointed out, they would always have the opportunity to help the poor, but they would not always have him. So even though helping the poor would be noble, what Mary chose was better. But as well as that, I don't think that Mary would actually have been thought of particularly well by the people who witnessed the event. We know that Judas scorned her, but he probably wasn't the only one. In those days, women wouldn't really have had much interaction with men at a dinner table. It's quite possible that they ate separately. But more than that, women in those days did not let down their hair, not in public. Not only does Mary let down her hair, she rubs the feet of Jesus with it. 
There wasn't anything inappropriate about what Mary did. I'm not saying that. But what we see is that she is prepared to forsake her dignity. She is prepared to endure the scorn of all those around her to serve Jesus. What an immense challenge for us today. We could spend weeks together in church looking at this, but here are a few simple thoughts. What about our own hearts? Are we willing to put Jesus first, to give him everything? This might mean that, like Mary, the people around us won't understand. Our friends might not understand. They might even walk away from us. Are we willing to pay that cost? Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, but there are certain social circles, maybe even members of our family, and and when we're around them, we tone ourselves down. We don't talk about Jesus. Maybe it's even in church. Maybe there are things we come to that we just treat as social events, and we don't talk about Jesus with our friends there. Maybe even it's in an act of service that we do. We just do what we always did, and we know that God is calling us to do something different, but we're afraid of what others might say, of their reaction if we try to make that change. I don't know what it is for each one of you, but as we look at Mary, who gave her best without a care in the world for what other people might say, the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Am I prepared to give everything for Jesus and completely disregard what other people think. Mary wasn't perfect. Again, I'm not saying that, but are we prepared to put Jesus first? Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. I don't know about you, but as I've prepared this week, I found John chapter 12 to be an incredibly challenging portion of scripture. In many ways, we all face the same temptations as the various characters in the story. How easy it is to put ourselves first and to dethrone Jesus in our hearts. The chief priests did it, the Pharisees. They were deep in sin, denying what was clearly evident in front of them. Judas did it, saying the right things, but in reality being more interested in what was in it for him. The crowd did it, saying and even at times doing the right things, but only really if it suited them. On the other hand, we have Mary. And again, I'm not saying she was perfect, but she gave all she had. She wasn't worried about the cost or about what others would think. She had the right perspective. Jesus came first. And if we're willing to give our lives to Jesus, or if we've done that before, but we're seeking to give him all of our lives, then we can know that he will speak up for us before the Father, just as he spoke up. For Mary. Following Jesus, it can be costly, but the rewards are glorious. An American missionary called Jim Elliot once put it like this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus offers you something wonderful. Give up what is going to perish in this world, all that will pass away, and take hold of everlasting life. So what about it? Maybe you're listening this morning and watching and you've been a Christian for many years, but maybe recently you've been holding back from Jesus. Maybe he's not the number one in your life. There's something or someone that comes higher up on your priority list. Or maybe it's even been something that on the face of it seems good that has been coming between you and the Lord, busyness with church before this lockdown or some other service. Will you make today the day when you finally submit everything to him? Or maybe you're here today and you haven't committed to Christ yet, perhaps because the cost seems just too big. But he has already taken the lead. He paid a cost higher than we can imagine when he died on the cross for your sin and mine. And he loves you and he offers you a share in this victory over sin and death. The question is, are you willing to accept this victory? It's nearly Easter time. We're looking forward to being able to celebrate that here in church together. But today, Palm Sunday, as we think of that crowd that shouted Hosanna, and as we ask with them, who is this? And as we see the answer, this is Jesus. Let's take hold of all he has given us. Let's hold nothing back and let's follow him today and always. Amen. Let's respond to what we've been thinking about this morning as we sing together.
all I once held dear. Thanks so much for tuning in to Church at Home this morning and over these past few months. Marty and I know that these services are no substitute for the real thing, but we hope that they have been a blessing and encouragement to you. But as I said earlier, we're going to be allowed to meet in person again, so our Good Friday service is this Friday at 8pm here in the church, and our service on Easter Sunday begins at 11am next Sunday. Please do let us know that you're coming just so that we can arrange the socially distanced seating. And you can do that by heading to our website, ravenhillchurch.org. Click on plan a visit and follow the instructions there. We'd really appreciate that. And please remember when you do come to church, it's all the same things as when we met before. Please do come early so that we can get everybody in. There are also some roadworks outside on the Ravenhill Road. I hope you haven't heard them. I've certainly heard them while I've recorded this. I hope they haven't disrupted you. But please do just allow for that. We don't know exactly what way that's going to be left on Sunday. So please come in good time. Please do queue outside in a socially distanced way. And unless you're exempt, please do wear a mask. And if you're tuning in and you don't belong to a church but you'd like to, or if you want to find out more about Jesus, then please do join us you'd be so welcome. I'm really looking forward to seeing lots of you then, but for now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen.